Okay, this is the second hour of Physics 1A. We're going to be talking about vectors. Just continue along with our list. In fact, here, let's copy this list. Bring it out here so we can see the rest of the class and what we're focusing on. So there we go. That's that's what we'll be talking about. Uh, we just talked about SI units and dimensional analysis. Now we're going to spend the rest of class probably talking about vectors. Okay, so the first thing to do would be to define what a vector is. Uh, and to do that, we need to also define a scalar. So you've got different quantities. You've got what are called scalar quantities. And we got vector quantities. So scalars are things like uh, like mass, for example. You'd say something has, has a mass of let's say five kilograms. Um, you could have time, ten seconds. Uh, you could have area. Could have volume. The key thing for all of these, the one thing that makes them all the same, is that uh, they only involve basically a number and a unit. And that's it. So scalar quantities contain a number and a unit, and that's it. The thing that differentiates them from vectors is they don't have a direction. So uh, volume, area, all of these, there's no direction associated with them, right? Scalar quantities, on the other hand, um, Oops, sorry, I was trying to Let's use the mouse. Just trying to change the color. So for vector quantities, you need to have um, the same thing that scalars have. You need to have a number, you need to have a unit, but then you have to add in a direction. So it's basically a scalar, then you add direction to that. And all of these have to have a direction, okay? So as an example of this, you have something like velocity. Velocity is a, a vector. And you could write it as something like 20 meters per second uh, northwest. Okay, so the fact that there's a direction in here is what differentiates a vector from a scalar. Um, vectors need at least, in two dimensions, you're going to need at least two, two things to describe them. Uh, you're going to need to have uh, a value of 20, and then you're going to need to have a direction. So you need to have the number as well as the direction. And that can be defined in different ways. Okay, we've got velocity, we've got acceleration. This could be like the acceleration due to gravity on Earth, which is about 10 meters per second uh, down. That's, that's a direction as well. Uh, force is another example of a vector. Uh, weight, which is an example of force, would be one as well. So uh, a force could be something like uh, 20 newtons, uh, toward a wall or something like that. Like you could push into a wall with a force of 20 newtons, right? All right. So in general, scalars are only going to require one number. Vectors are going to require two. Okay. Now, when I say 20 meters to the northwest, what I could be meaning is, suppose I have a, a map and I'm standing uh, or I'm on a bike or something and I move with a vector uh, that points with a length of 20 meters per second. And if I want to represent northwest, um, or here, I already drew it this way. So we'll, we'll do a different one. Nope, nope, let's, let's do what I said. Let's do northwest. So northwest would be like, if this is north, east, south, and west, then northwest is going to point up this way. Right? So this could be a velocity vector. Maybe we, we use a V to represent it. And we see the length of this vector is 20 meters per second. And then when I say northwest, what I mean is that there's an angle right here, theta, where theta is equal to 45 degrees. Okay. That'd be an example of a vector. Let me show you another one that is a little bit uh, less intuitive. Let's say I draw a vector like this, okay, and I tell you that this is also a velocity vector. Um, it represents the speed that something's traveling, and let's say that it has a length of 25 meters per second. And then 
let's say that we have another angle here that I call phi, and let's say that the angle phi is equal to, let's say 10 degrees, okay? If I wanted to write this vector, and let's label it something, let's call this one vector v2. If I wanted to write that vector, what I would write it as, I'd say v2 is equal to 25 meters per second at 10 degrees south of east. Okay, this type of notation you're gonna see show up quite a bit, south of east, east of north, west of south, etc. those kind of things. And the way that you need to understand this is this is 10 degrees starting from east, traveling south, right? The vector is, the angle is measured like that. So here's south, here's east, this is east, uh, south of east, right? South of east. Because this is east and you're below east, that's where the south comes from. North of east would be up here. Okay, does that type of definition make sense to everyone? I know that this is, this is gonna throw you off, but we'll do some examples and hopefully you get comfortable with them, okay? All right, so vectors are generally represented in these type of arrows like this. And we're gonna talk about properties of them and things like that, but yeah, in general, the way we, we can draw vectors is to say, you know, you just basically take an arrow like this and I'm gonna label this vector to be some vector that we call A. I'm going to use this type of notation when I write vectors. I'll always put an arrow above them. I'll usually write it like that, but you can also write it with an arrow like this. Okay, so that's kind of our notation for a vector. In the book, the notation for the vector could just be a bold A, okay? Um, yeah. And we can, we can kind of define some, some quantities of vector here. So, for example, if we write something like this, if I write a vector here, I call it vector A, if I put two lines on the side of it like this, what I'm saying is this is the magnitude of the vector. And the word magnitude is really just a substitute for another word, which is size. The magnitude of the vector is represented by the length of the vector. So the longer it is, the bigger it is. Um, we can construct vectors like vectors that are twice as big and stuff like that if we want to. But the word magnitude just means the size, or it means the length of the vector. Okay. All right, so what are some properties of vectors? So, first of all, um, we know how to draw a vector. And in general, when you're drawing vectors in this class, you want to draw them to scale. That's actually one of the things that came up with the question that Chase was asking about how to draw those things on that, that diagram. Um, yeah. And one of the first kind of things that we want to be able to do with vectors uh, is we want to be able to move them around. So if I take a vector like this vector A right here, and I make a copy of it, and I move it around to here or to here, or to here, or here, or wherever. It's still the same vector. So one of the properties of vectors is that we can freely move them anywhere we want to, and it's still the same vector, okay? It's still the same vector. That's one of the things we can do with vectors. I can put two vectors together like this, I can put them here, I can do whatever I want. The main thing is that you have to not change the direction. The direction has to stay the same, the length has to stay the same, otherwise it is, it is the same vector. So these two vectors are identical to each other. Although the one on the right looks a lot thicker. And I don't know why that is. But they're identical because they have the same length and the same direction. So that's how we define vectors that are equivalent to each other. Same length, same direction. It doesn't matter where we put them. So that's the first very important property of vectors. We can move them wherever we want. Wherever is easiest for us. Okay. The second property of, that we'd like to know is how do I add two vectors together? So if I give you another vector, and let's use a different color. So if I give you another vector, of course, the moment I change color, it, it, it gets rid of the thing. Okay, so there we go. Let's take this vector and let's draw it like this, maybe, like that, there we go. And this vector we'll call B. So the next thing we'd like to know is how do I add the vectors A plus B to get a new vector? 
All right, well, this is where uh, our first um, rule comes in real handy. I can move these vectors anywhere that I want to. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move them so that they are tip to tail. Um, I'm going to take the vector A. I've already copied it, so we'll just take this one. I'm going to make a copy of vector B. I don't even need to, right? I can just drag it over here like that. Because again, one of the properties is we can move them wherever we want to. It's still the same vector. Now, when I add these vectors together, let's say that these vectors represent a displacement. Okay, I didn't write this down here, but another vector that we could use uh, that's going to be one that we use a lot, actually, um, we call displacement. This could be something like 10 meters um, north. Something like that. So if these represent displacements, and I say the displacement is to go from this point to this point, that's A, and displacement B says to go from this point to this point, then if I want to know what A plus B is, that would be like saying I walk along vector A, and then I walk along vector B, and I want to figure out what the sum of the two vectors is. The sum is basically the shortest distance between the beginning and the end. So in this case, our what we call often the resultant vector will be drawn from here up to here. You go from the tail to the tip, and you put them together like this. And that's going to give us the vector that we call A plus B. All right. Now another property that we can write down now that we know how to add the vectors together, put them tip to tail, is that um, addition with vectors obeys a rule that's common in mathematics, which is that you can switch the order. So if I do A plus B, that's going to be the same thing as B plus A. It does not matter in what order we actually add them together. And just to prove that, if I told you that A plus B involves putting A here, and then putting B on the end of it, B plus A, you might think, would then be, okay, that means we take B and we do it first, right? So what I'm going to do is, just to kind of prove the point, I'm going to move B over to the other side over here, like this. So there's our vector B, right? And then I'm going to take the other freestanding vector A that was up here, and I'm going to slide it in here. You'll notice that without really trying, these things line up perfectly. Here, I don't, I don't want this piece to come with it. I just want to take this piece. Come in. You'll notice that this fits perfectly right there and forms a parallelogram. And this is kind of the idea that I could I could have started with B and then I could have added A and it doesn't matter. A plus B is the same thing as B plus A. It's this black line in the middle that we call A plus B, right? Okay. Now we can take this a step further. We can add in another vector uh, to get another property. So this is one of our main properties. Um, the next property that we could add in is, it doesn't matter what order you add them in. So if I tell you that I have a vector A, a vector B, and I want to add to that a vector C, then I can either add A plus B and then add C, or equivalently, I could add A to the sum of B plus C. The first property is called a commutative property. The second property is called an associative property. You know, this stuff works just like math does, right? I mean, A plus B equals B plus A. You learned that in your some of your early arithmetic classes, right? 2 plus 3 is equal to 3 plus 2. And you learn the second one down here, too. So these, these vector properties also apply to, to, to numbers as well. Okay, how can we prove this one? A plus B plus C is equal to... Well, we need to take A plus B... Can I hold? Oh, control select, right? Oh, it won't let me select them together. That's weird. Okay, whatever. We'll copy this one down here. We'll copy this one down here. Put them tip to tail. So I've got A and B. I need to add another vector C. So let's create a new vector. Let's say the vector C goes up like this. So this is a vector that we're going to call C. And if I want to add A plus B to C, well, we've already got A plus B right here. Let's put it down here. There's A plus B. And I want to add C to that. Well, the rule says all I got to do is take this vector and just put it at the end of our new vector here. OK, 
Okay, so just to remind what these were. Purple was A. Blue was B. And then the black line was A plus B. And if I want to get the resultant of these, the sum of these, I need to connect from the beginning of here all the way to there. That should give A plus B plus C, because there's A plus B. We're adding C to it by putting it at the end, so that green line represents the vector A plus B plus C, where basically we added these two first, right? Now we could have added B plus C first if we wanted to. To prove that, that's what we'll do. So we'll take this one. So there's C. We'll take B. Now we want to do B plus C first, right? So what we'll do... This over here. So here's vector B. And if we want to do B plus C first, that means we need to connect these two together. So we'll go... So that's B plus C. Right, we got B and C, they're tip to tail. And now we need to get A in the picture. So we need to add to that A. So let's take our vector A here. And we need to add that to the end. Now I'm going to move this whole thing over to the left here. So we need to add this one. Oops. There's B plus C. We need to add to that that one. There's A. And finally, let's just see if this one fits. This was A plus B plus C before. We basically done B plus C plus A. We've done this. Let's see if this one fits in between. So we copy that one, we paste it down here, and we're free to do these things. Let's see if this lines up perfectly. I don't know if it's going to line up exactly perfectly because there's some thickness to these lines. That's pretty close, right? So that would represent the other one. That would be uh, this one oops, in green. Uh, would be B plus C first plus A. And they're the same. They are the same vector, for sure. They are the same vector. What I could do, really, is I'm going to draw this line, and then I'll erase it. I could draw another line from here to here just to prove it, but um, I think visually you should be able to see that. I should have made the vector C not point so much this way because these are kind of along the same line. But that all makes sense? You have any questions? All right, so that's our second property. Doesn't matter what order we add them in, it will always get the same answer. Now, we can, we can actually say this in a way that makes even more sense. For example, um, suppose you have a city and in that city you've got a grid of streets, right? So let's say this is a city and these are streets, okay? Uh, let's do one more row. Okay, so the, this is a city. These are like the corners right here, right? And let's say that you start off at this corner right here and you want to get to this corner here. So this is your starting point and your goal is to get to point X, right? Now there's a lot of ways you can get there, right? You can go straight up this street and then you can go right and you can go straight over. That's one way to do it. We could go up. That could be one vector, right? And then we could go over. That could be another vector. Or we could have done the B part first, right? We could have gone B and then A. It doesn't matter. Even though we walk by different things, maybe along this path, there's a, there's a duck pond that you can stop by and throw some food to the ducks. And so you decide to go this way because it's more scenic, right? Um, maybe there's more traffic along this path, right? So, so it doesn't matter which we choose, whether we go A first and then B, you could go B first and then A, it doesn't really matter. But of course, we could do it in even more steps, right? We could also, let's say that we, we want to visit uh, a friend's house that's located at this purple dot right here along the way of getting from our starting point to our ending point. Well, then we could go up, we could go over, and here we have two choices too. We can either go right or we, it doesn't matter, right? 
will always get to the same spot. And, and this could be done in, in three different displacements, right? Why doesn't it work with flying? It should work with flying. But you said never mind, so I guess you think it does. So this is just another example of how vectors can be used. And ultimately, all the vectors that we use in this class will actually be broken down exactly like this. We're going to make it so that our vectors, instead of being at these like weird angles like this, we're always you're always going to be able to break our vectors down into these smaller pieces that, that either go right or up or left or down, basically. Just like in an xy plane, right? Okay, so there's a couple properties of vectors right there. Uh, the next property that we would need to talk about is how do you subtract vectors, okay? And in order to subtract vectors, we need to be able to know what the negative of a, ve of a vector is. So to do that, this is actually pretty simple. Let's take one of our vectors, like take the vector C, for example. Let's pull it down here. What is negative C then? Negative C, what vector would that be? Well, it turns out that uh, negative means you just change the direction by 180 degrees. So a negative C we could get by copying this. Yeah, a lot of you are saying it, um, pasting it, and then just flipping it around 180 degrees. But I immediately did a really, I did a bad job of that. What's the best way of doing this? I guess the best way of doing it actually would just be to, uh... huh, I bet there's ways to invert things here, right? I don't know. Okay, so instead, here's what I'm going to do. We're just going to do a... Um an equivalent version of it. Whoops, didn't mean to change colors and shapes, this one. So what I'll do is I'll just put a line basically almost right on top of this here. And I'll have it point exactly in the opposite direction. That's pretty close, right? So that would be negative C then, opposite direction. And usually you probably write these, oops, oops, come on, pick that one up. There you go, something like that. That would be negative C. So if this is positive C, then negative C just points back in the opposite direction. Now that we know what this is, we can do things like we can say, well, what is A minus B going to be equal to then? Well, this is going to be the same thing as A plus negative B. Okay, so let's go up here and let's grab our vector A. Use the same one. Let's grab our vector B. Ah, but for B, we need to reverse it. So we'll draw another vector that points opposite direction. Now, can I just put it right on top here? I probably can, right? You can go right out to there and then just move it. Yeah, there we go. So that's our negative B. Now, how do I add A to negative B? Well, I do exactly the same thing I did before. I put it right there. So just to be clear what we're doing here, this is our negative B. That was B. You can see this one goes up to the left. This goes down to the right. Uh, that was our vector A. So again, what we'll do is we'll just connect this line right here to get A minus B. So we go here and go shapes, and then we go A minus B will be like that. So there we go. Now we know how to subtract vectors. I believe there is another method for doing this, which I'll show you right now. So if I take A and I put it right here, and then I take B, if I put these guys tip to tail, I'll show you something here. Look at that. It's one of the thing, there's a lot of things that are bad about online classes, but when it comes to vectors and stuff, it's pretty helpful. Let me move the A plus B inside, A minus B inside here. So look at this. I put vector A and B kind of tail to tail. We call this the tail to tail method of subtraction. And if you happen to do it like this, just look at that. It fits perfectly right there. You see that? Now, I want to do, let's see, can I just select that piece and copy-paste it? Because that's another method of doing A minus B. All right, so you can either do this method. Let's delete these off of here now. You can either do this method where you draw in negative B, or you can write it like this. And just to prove to you that this works, we can do a little quick calculation here. If you'll notice something here, if I look at vector B alone, vector B... plus this piece right here that goes straight up, you'll notice that these are connected tip to tail right here, right? They're connected tip to tail. That means that what I've drawn here is B plus A minus B. Can you see how I've drawn, that, that's what this is drawn here? Maybe it's easier to see if the A vector is not there. 
right? If I take that out, this is b plus a minus b, right? But then what's that equal to? Well, you could do some really simple mathematics with this equation here and see, well, obviously I've got a b and I've got a negative b, so those cancel and I just am left with a. One way in which this is going to show up later in this class when we talk about circular motion is I might have some origin point, for example, and I may describe the distance out to a location as some vector that I call maybe your initial vector. I'll call it R initial. And then maybe an object moves from that position to some position here. And I want to call that position R final. And then I ask, what's the displacement between these two positions? And the answer will be that this vector from here to here would be what I'd call delta r, the change in r, where delta r is equal to r final minus r initial. And if you compare what's going on right here to what I just drew right here in boxed, they look the same, right? That vector drawn from B to A is the same thing as the vector drawn from RI to RF, right? So this will be pretty handy. We'll bring this back up at that time. Um, but uh, yeah, so now we have to find vector addition and vector subtraction. Does anyone have any seconds or any questions? What else is there to define? Oh, how do you uh, scale a vector would be the next thing to define. If you do have questions, keep keep typing and go ahead and go ahead and ask them, and I'll answer them as, as you write them out. Uh, how do you scale a vector? So, um, say you want to find a vector that's half as long or twice as long. Well, if I want to do twice as long, this is easy enough. So let's say I give you a vector here, and I call that vector d. And I want to figure out what two d is. Well, to get two d, you can just put d on top of d, and that'll give you a new vector that when combined together is as a length of two times D. So this would be two times D. So basically what we wanna, what we're kind of defining here is multiplication by a scalar. And what it does is it just stretches the vector. And says, can you divide vectors? We don't really have a definition for division by vectors. We can multiply them though. Oh, 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 sorry. You can divide by a scalar. Like, I could write um, 1 over 3 times d, and what that would be is a vector uh, with 1 third the length of d. So when you multiply by a scalar, as long as it's not negative, all you do is you either... If you multiply by a number greater than one, you make the vector longer by that amount. So if I wanted to do, for example, 1.5d, then I would take the same vector and increase it by half, like I'd take half of it and then just extend it. Yep, this shrinks the vector. One third of d would shrink the vector. Okay, let's actually draw what that would look like. So one third of d would be, we take the same vector here and we need to shrink it by a third. So it's gonna be something like Something like about like that long, right? That would be one third D. One third D. So dividing by three is gonna shrink it. Um, you mean scalar is magnitude. When I say multiplication by a scalar, I mean multiplying by any type of a scalar, okay? That scalar could just be a number, but it could also be like a mass. Let me give you, let me, let me show you an equation that uses that. Um, that we will use a lot in this class. Net force. What is force? Is force a vector or a scalar? It's a vector, right? Force equal to mass times acceleration. Now, mass is a scalar, so we don't draw a vector symbol above it. But we do on the A. So you can not only can you multiply by 2, you can multiply by 2 kilograms, and that would alter what the thing was. Now, if I multiply a vector by just a number, I don't change what it is. So if D was a representation of a vector like it, it, you know, if D was, uh, let's say, 10 meters per second, for example, if that was the magnitude, then 2D would be 20 meters per second. 
and one third d would be whatever 3.3 .3 meters per second right um if instead i multiplied by mass i would then produce a momentum so i could do mass times this mass is a scalar and that would change the unit but uh, yeah so multiplication multiplication by a scalar is defined you can also divide by a scalar okay trying to think of an example of where you would divide by a scalar i think i gave you an example earlier no i didn't actually There you go. I believe that's an example. In fact, I shouldn't write it like that. There we go. Displacement divided by time squared gives you the acceleration due to gravity. And in fact, I could, I could just call this acceleration if I want to. So this would be an example of dividing by a scalar. But to go back to the question that Angie said, I can't put a vector down here, actually. I can't divide a vector by a vector. That definition is not defined um, in mathematics. You can only divide by scalars. You can only divide by scalars. Now, you're going to have equations that put quantities that are vectors in the denominator. Um, what's a good example of that? Force of gravity, I guess. Here, this is a weird one because we know force has to be. Does, does this uh, equation look some, uh, familiar to you all? Force of gravity is equal to the gravitational constant, the mass of one object times the mass of the other object divided by the distance between the squared. Now, the distance between two objects could definitely be a vector, right? Like I could have planet A right here, and I could have planet B right here, right? And I could say, well, suppose I'm standing on A and I want to get to B. Boom! You go that way, right? That's a vector. So it appears we're dividing by a vector here, but we're not because it just says r squared. So another way to write that would be like this. It's just the magnitude of the vector that shows up in the denominator. Okay. Um, I think we can keep going. Any other questions that anyone has? Nope. Okay. What other properties do we need? We've got multiplication by a scalar. We figured adding, subtracting. I don't think I'm leaving anything out. I think that's covered all the basic properties. We're going to talk about, uh, after we do some things, uh, we'll talk about how you multiply vectors. Uh, there's two different ways, called the scalar product and the cross products, and we'll, we'll get there. Okay, so the next thing to talk about is components. Now, I've got to see if, yeah, the first problem that I've got up here is with components. We need to define what those are. Okay. Now components are going to allow us to basically um, we use a coordinate system like this. Make it black. So when we say components of vectors, um, this is like the things that compose the vector. This would be like, uh, for, as an analogy, think about like a hydrogen atom, right? We know a hydrogen atom may, is made up of like a proton and an electron, right? And then there's something called deuterium where you add another neutron to the nucleus. It's a type of hydrogen, right? Uh, so components of vectors are similar. They're the pieces of the vectors. They're what make up the vector. Um, and there are really lots of options of, of how you can do it, but usually the way we do it is like this. So we take a coordinate system. This is the simplest way to do it. You take a XY Cartesian coordinate system uh, with uh, even spacings everywhere. And on this diagram, we'll draw a vector and we'll, we'll make it so that it comes from the origin. I hate, that, I hate the way that does that. Okay, I think that should do it. Is it doing it? Let's see. Yeah, okay. So I draw some vector. And let's make it so that it's not exactly 90 degrees. 
something like that probably. Let's say that I call this vector vector A, okay? It has a length, it has a direction, goes up and to the right. And this vector undoubtedly makes an angle with the x-axis. This is how we're always going to want to define our angles. It's going to be relative to the x-axis, if we can. Can't always do it. And what I'm going to say is that I could, I could take this vector and I could break it into components. And what those components would look like would be, there'd be one component that would point uh, parallel to the x-axis, like this. Like that. And what I want to do is I want to draw it out just until I may need to shorten that one in a second. I don't know. So that's going to be what we call our X component. And I'm going to label it as such. I'll call it A sub X. I'll put a vector symbol above it. We'll call that our X component. Let me, let me, let me write that down in case that's helpful to see those words written out. X component. And then we'll draw in a Y component. And we'll use blue for that one. No, it should go from here up to here. Now, I'm, I'm going to have to just play around with this until it fits right in here perfectly. Otherwise, I'll be bothered. I actually drew A out pretty well here, I think. I think I'm going to have to extend this one just a little bit, though. Okay, now why did I draw it like that? Well, it's because of the, um, the thing that we just learned about adding vectors. I could easily say that since the vector A sub X goes to the right, and vector a sub y goes up, that the sum of vector ax plus vector ay should be equal to vector a. And if it's helpful, I'll put these all in the same colors there on the diagram, because I know that can be helpful for from time to time. So ay was that color. We'll make this one red. And we'll make the symbols black. That's a true statement, right? Undoubtedly, this is a true mathematical statement about vectors because of the way that they've been placed right here. So in that sense, AX is the X component and AY is the Y component that compose or make up vector A. Now, from our picture, knowing a little bit about trig, uh, we can say the following. I can say that uh, the vector AX has a length and if I wanted to find the length of that vector, remember that we put these little bars on the side of it, and now this just means the length of the vector. Um, according to trig, uh, I can make a cosine, the cosine of theta, by taking that vector, a sub x, which is the adjacent side, and dividing by the magnitude of vector a. Right? or written in a slightly more kind of compact and, and easier to follow notation, I think. If I just multiply this one to the right-hand side, what I can say is that a sub x is basically equal to a times the cosine of theta. In fact, I'm going to kind of assume that you know this part, so I'm usually going to skip this step, and I'm just going to immediately write that. Okay. That if I know this angle, I know that the length AX is always going to be basically A times cosine theta. So you need to get good at just kind of seeing that, you know? Uh, by the same logic, we can do the same thing with AY, right? So vector A sub Y, if I divide that by the magnitude of vector A, again, I can't do this. Uh, as Someone asked you a question, I'm not allowed to divide vector by vector, but as long as I do magnitudes, there's no problem. So this, here, let's, let's keep things the same colors. Okay. So AY divided by A, this is going to be our cosine, or sorry, sine, oops, opposite. And then we multiply this over here, and that gives us the equation we're going to use a lot, which is just the Y component you get by just doing the sine. Right? And that's it. That's what components of vectors are. Now they're really useful, and I'll show you why they're useful by showing how we can use them for addition. So let's do that real quick here. Uh, I think what we could do to save a little bit of time, okay, first of all, let's see what time it is. I'm used to being able to see the time as I'm talking. Whew. We covered some stuff, I guess, but wow, I've got like four minutes. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to do 
this, you know, relatively quickly here. All right, so let's take the same picture. Copy it. Eventually, we're going to unselect this, right? What if I just click paste? Okay, that's fine. I'm going to move it down. Okay, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to add onto our picture, and we may need to make it just a little bit bigger. There we go. Uh, I'm going to add onto our picture another vector. In fact, making it bigger was not. That was not a help. Really just need to extend the X and Y axes. That's what we need to do. All right. We'll just do this. We'll just slap it on top of it right there. That's good enough, right? Okay. So now what I want to do is I want to add another vector on here. So we'll add another vector that we'll call B. Here's another color. And we'll have vector B kind of go something like that, I guess. That's fine. We'll call that vector B. Now, we know how to add A plus B. Move this inside here. To add A plus B, all we have to do is just connect this line. there to there. So we know that that's vector A plus B. And what is it going to be in components? Well, now what we can do, here I think I can safely get rid of the X and Y's here. I think you guys understand that this is the X direction. I'll just write it over here. So now what I want to do is I basically want to break up B into components as well. And to do so, we'll use the same colors. So first of all, we're going to have one component of B. Let's do this one first. It's probably easier to do. It's going to point basically this direction. It's not going to be this long. I'm just getting an idea of where I need to put it because I want to make a right angle down here. And then I'll just shorten it up to about here. We'll change that as we need to. And then for the X component, I actually probably just copy paste this and then just make it the right length. So there we go. So those are going to be our components for B. Is that still parallel? Sure, why not? So the, the component on bottom, we'll, we're going to define because it's parallel to the x direction, we call that one b sub x. And the component that's parallel to the y direction, we call b sub y. We can put vectors on here if we want to. But now, let's give um, a new name to this vector. Let's call this vector c. All right. Now, vector C also has components, right? I'm going to draw them on a different axis. So vector C has components that I'm going to put over here. So one vector will be here. That's going to be C sub x. And then we'll have C sub y, which will point right along the axis like this. So there we go. OK, so now from this picture, you can kind of be able to see all you need to see. This is C sub x. And this is C sub y. But we can make the following statements over here. So the first statement we have is this one. A plus B equals C. The other statements we can make are this. According to our picture, what is C sub x equal to? If you just look at the picture, how long is C sub x? Can you see it? It's AX plus BX. That's exactly right. Another thing we can do is we can say, yeah, CX is a vector, but actually AX and BX and CX, they all point in the same direction. So we don't even really need the vector sign anymore, right? Because if AX was a length of three and BX was a length of one, then CX would have a length of four, right? We don't really need vectors for that, right? They're all in the same direction, and that's the power of this. Uh, likewise, then, you can see pretty clearly from the picture, I hope, that the length of CY is the same as ay plus by. You could just visibly see it on the picture, right? That this vic this vector that's longer here is composed of this smaller vector plus this smaller vector. It's just, just like rectangles, right? You can see it. So that means that c sub y is then going to be a sub y plus b sub y. Well, that's really powerful, right? That's really powerful. And if we go in here and we throw in another angle, 
So let's say we come over here and we call this angle, angle phi. We can kind of go a step farther if we want to. I don't know if this is necessary. But we said before that a sub x was equal to uh, a times the cosine of theta, right? And b sub x is going to be b times the cosine of phi. Another way to write this one would be a y is going to be a, just throw a sine right there. And then you add to that b times the sine of phi. Okay, so the power of components is that we can we can use them to make addition really simple. We can use them to make addition really simple. By adding components, it's a lot easier than doing the following. Let me give you an example here. So suppose that I have a vector, and I tell you my vector a, let's say that this is, okay, so let's say that a is a, has a vector that has a length of, let's say, 5 meters uh, at an angle of 37 degrees, where by this I mean above the x-axis, okay? And let's say that I say vector b shorter than a, right? Looks shorter. So let's say vector b is 4 meters, and let's say that it has a, a length, uh, let's say it has an angle of 60 degrees. Which degree are we used because from the drawing I count 3? If you, what I'm going to do is I'm always going to measure my, my, vec, my angles relative to the x-axis. And that's as if you were to like come in here and draw a new coordinate system basically, and there's your angle. Does that answer your question? Hudson? Kind of. What other angles do you see? You're seeing like this angle here, this angle here, all that stuff. Yeah, it's a little confusing. So so the best way to do it is just if we all agree on the same kind of uh, definition, we always make the, the angles relative to the x-axis. Angle A, B, and C, which one do you use for the formula? Uh... Here, I'll, I'll answer your question when we go on break, I think. So let's, uh, okay, let's look at this. Let's suppose that we define our vectors like this. If I just give you that information, it's pretty hard to tell me what a plus b is equal to, right? It's pretty hard. Would you all agree? Is it equal to 9? 5 plus 4 is 9, right? So is the length of C9? Absolutely not. There's no way it's 9, right? On our picture, if this length is 5 and that length is 4, then at best, this length is like... I mean, it might be related to 9, but it's not going to be 9, right? That's not right. It's hard because when you throw in the angles, it gets kind of hard. However, if you plug them into those formulas up there, all of a sudden it gets really easy because then you find out what Cx and Cy are, right? And then if the question is, what's the magnitude of vector C... Well, we can use components for that, too. We can use the Pythagorean theorem. Right? And then what if I also want to know this angle right here? Let's say I call that angle alpha, and I mean all the way. Well, the angle alpha, we can also use trig for that. The inverse tangent of Cy over Cx gives us what the angle alpha is. So this method of components, which we'll do problems here in a second with us, actually when we come back, um, it allows us to, to vastly simplify, simplify the operation of adding vectors. And guess what? In this class, for the first like two or three weeks, all we're going to be doing is adding vectors on diagrams um, to kind of get better at this kind of stuff. Now, will you always remember that this is what you're doing? I don't know. But uh, hopefully, when you're doing your problems on your homework, uh, you'll rely on components as a method to simplify problems. It's, uh, it's right at the core of what we'll be doing for the rest of the week because uh, our, our very first kind of physics equation that we're going to be using is Newton's first law, which says that if you add up all the forces acting on a system, they add to zero. And it turns out that the simplest way to do this is to break this up into two equations. Add up all the forces in the x direction, they should add to zero, and add up all the forces in the y direction, they should add to zero. So guess what? You're immediately using components. And again, I feel like to some extent... What I've defined here about adding components, this is something that you're going to use constantly in this class, but you might not realize you're doing it. So if you ever get lost on what you're doing when you're solving these type of problems in this class, don't hesitate to go back to chapter one and brush up on what a vector is. Because after working on physics problems for a few weeks, if you then go back and look at the kind of the, the mathematics, it'll, it'll mean more to you, right? 
I'm sure that's happened to you in many things in your life where you're taught something and then you go start to apply it and you forget what you're doing. You go back and you brush up on it again and it helps a lot, right? So um, that's a pretty good place to stop for the first uh, hour or second hour. So we'll take a break for 10 minutes. So it's four or five, we'll take a break till 4.15. And um, I'll answer whatever questions I can. <laughs> 